So welcome to part two of our lecture on the ancient Greeks. And mostly in the first part, we talked about uh, political developments related to uh, the birth of democracy, particularly in connection with Athens. From this point forward, we're going to be looking more at uh, kind of different conflicts involving the Greeks and then looking at Alexander the Great and the creation of what's often referred to as the Hellenistic world. Hellenistic, a term meaning uh, to imitate the Greeks. Uh, but the first conflict, well before we get there, is going to be the first encounter the Greeks have with the Persians. And we haven't really looked at the Persian Empire yet. We're going to be looking at them in more detail in the next lecture. Uh, but they had created a huge empire centered around what today is the country of Iran, but expanding at some point into Asia Minor, roughly corresponding to modern day Turkey and directly across the sea from ancient Greece. Uh, though we should be careful, right? When we think of ancient Greece, we tend to associate it with the modern state of Greece. Uh, meaning we're leaving out a large number of Greek cities that are emerging uh, or, over this period along the western coast of Asia Minor. So kind of the whole Aegean Sea, kind of a, a Greek sea, right? The Greek world encompassing a much greater amount of territory than what corresponds to modern day Greece. And at some point, uh, this expanding Persian Empire is going to run into some of these Greek city-states. Uh, among them, by the way, uh, this corresponds to where Troy had been located uh, and continue to exist uh, likely up until this point. Uh, but in any event, at some point, uh, this Persian Empire was starting to uh, incorporate, basically conquer these Greek city-states. And at some point, some of them looked to Athens for assistance. And so at some point, the Athenians were sending, uh, sending their navy over there to help out. Uh, in one case, helping one Greek city-state rebel against their Persian overlords. And eventually, the, uh, the Persians decided to retaliate uh, uh, because of this. And that led to the first Persian attack on Greece proper, on, on mainland Greece. This was during the reign of the Persian uh, Shah, is the term they use uh, in the Persian Empire, a uh, fellow named Darius. And again, this was primarily because the Athenians had aided a rebellion in Asia Minor. So kind of the idea of putting the Greeks in their place. Uh, and so actually it didn't go very well for the Persians. The decisive battle, uh, the Battle of Marathon, which took place in 490 BCE, and the Persian army was soundly defeated by the Greeks. Uh, by the way, the word marathon, referring to a 26 mile long race, uh, takes its name from the plain of Marathon, where this battle took place, because after the Greek victory, uh, a messenger ran the distance, roughly 26 miles, from Marathon to Athens to report on the victory. Uh, and by the way, I mean, he ran so fast and so hard that he actually died as soon as he got to Athens. And we see that scene depicted here in the painting. Uh, I always found that somewhat ironic. I could understand if they had suffered a defeat uh, that they would have wanted to alert the Athenians to the approaching uh, Persian army. Uh, but in this case, it was a victory. In any event, uh, the Persians are going to decide that they, they need to mount a much more serious attack uh, on Greece after that. This will happen un under the next Persian ruler, a fellow named Xerxes, who will mount a massive invasion of Greece in 480. So this is 10 years later, and they're going to send a huge force of roughly 150,000 troops together with almost 700 naval vessels. So it's going to be kind of a two-pronged attack by land and by sea, something illustrated by the map that you see here, where you can see the Persian forces are, uh, the army is kind of marching north and then coming around the northern part of the Aegean Sea and then descending uh, from a kind of mountainous terrain into Greece proper. In the meantime, uh, the Persian Navy sailing more directly across the Aegean Sea. Probably the most famous battle in connection with this particular uh, chapter of the conflict would be the Battle of Thermopylae. Uh, some of you might have seen the, the movie 300, which is basically about how, you know, as the Persian army was kind of descending into Greece from the north, uh, at some point they came at a pass, a very narrow pass, 
known as Thermopylae between, uh, you know, kind of mountainous ridges, and, and that would cause a bottleneck, right? And so a small number of Spartan troops, roughly 300, were able to hold back the Persians uh, at this particular location, again, in part because of the bottleneck, which only allowed a limited number of Persian soldiers to come through uh, until the Greek forces uh, could kind of, you know, get their act together and prepare for the Persians, right? So it's what we call kind of a holding action. And eventually the Persians did break through, right? But this small number of Spartans were able to hold them off for a sufficiently long, period, long enough period of time uh, that basically allowed the Greeks to prepare uh, you know, more ably for the full uh, onslaught of the Persian army. In actual fact, the decisive battle will take place at sea under the leadership of an Athenian named Themistocles. So it will be the Athenian navy that wins the day, and the decisive battle is the Battle of Salamis. And eventually the Greeks will prove victorious finally defeating the Persians at both land and sea as of 479 BCE. So thus ends the second encounter between the Greeks and the Persians. Again, the Greeks are victorious. And at that point, uh, Athens has pretty much emerged as one of the leading cities in Greece. This doesn't mean that the Persians are actually done with the Greeks, and particularly so long as they have a sizable navy in the Mediterranean, they pose a threat against which the Athenians are able to convince the other Greek city-states to form a defensive alliance, what comes to be known as the, uh, the Delian League, basically under Athenian leadership, with the idea of defending Greece against future attacks by the Persians. And eventually the League is able to destroy the Persian fleet uh, in 469 BCE, after which uh, it, it seems to most of the city-states that the Persians no longer pose a threat. And in fact, many of them try to withdraw from the League, uh, at which point Athens forces them to remain. Uh, and it starts to feel like the purpose of the League is not so much to defend Greece collectively against Persian attack, uh, but rather as a kind of a vehicle for Athenian imperialism, for Athens to dominate the other city-states. Uh, and at some point, uh, well, a number of city-states are not happy with this arrangement, but there's one city-state in particular, not a part of the Delian League, that is going to feel particularly threatened by this. And would anyone like to guess before we go to the next slide? Yes, I'm sure most of you knew that it would be Sparta, right? So the Spartans are beginning to feel threatened by Athens, uh, which seems to be kind of pulling together a number of city-states to create a rather formidable military force. And eventually this is going to bring the two into conflict, uh, initiating what's known as the Peloponnesian Wars, a reference to Peloponnesus, the kind of large uh, landmass kind of separate from the rest of Greece by a small, connected by a small isthmus, a small, like little narrow piece of land where Sparta is located. And the primary cause for this conflict, which is actually going to carry on for quite some time between 431 and 404 BCE, is that Sparta is fearful that Athens is beginning to develop a, a massive empire, and that if they don't stop Athens now, uh, later on it would prove to be too late. Uh, so, you know, militarily speaking, we're kind of giving the short version of this. Uh, the strength of Athens is its navy. For Sparta, it's more its army, right? So Athens is going to try to use its navy to weaken Spartan, uh, Sparta. The Spartans are going to try and draw the Athenians uh, into a land war. Uh, and meanwhile, Sparta is going to form a rival league, one to rival the Delian League, uh, known as the Peloponnesian League. And to make a long story short, I mean, ultimately, Sparta is pretty much victorious, right? Athens is defeated, the Athenian Empire dissolved, but really the main impact of all of this is to greatly weaken Greece as a whole, right? So after the conclusion of the Peloponnesian War, you're going to have about a 70-year period of continual conflict between the various city-states, uh, which is only going to weaken all of them and basically make them ripe for the picking by any outside force. Uh, you know, that is really able to kind of, uh, you know, present a formidable army. And that will actually be King Philip II of Macedonia. Macedonia being the a kingdom that emerges to the north of Greece, uh, 
uh, and at some point really adopts much of Greek culture as its own, but uh, never really seen as being fully Greek, right? But we'll get to that in a, in a bit before we, uh, you know, Philip II, of course, is the father of Alexander the Great. But before we get to him, uh, I, I did want to look at certain kind of cultural developments associated with the Greeks. We already talked about, you know, kind of political developments that would have, you know, kind of far reaching influence down the road. Uh, some other really uh, important ways in which the Greeks would be influential, uh, one would be theater, right? The Greeks are particularly well known for their contributions to theater. In fact, how we think about theater today is pretty much derived from the Greeks, right? So it was a little bit different back in the day. Uh, you know, so plays in terms of their structure in some ways would be very familiar uh, from our point of view. Uh, though back then they would have taken place in outdoor theaters, initially as part of religious festivals. And, you know, they weren't primarily, at least initially, weren't primarily for entertainment purposes, though over time that became a major aspect uh, of, you know, how they were written, how they were performed and so forth. Initially, though, meant to educate people. The most popular kind of theater was drama. Uh, and in fact, uh, in terms of how we think of, of the term drama, what it signifies, pretty much coming from the Greeks. Now, the first Greek dramas were tragedies, right? Tragedies would have had very unhappy endings, would have you know, had a very kind of serious tone all the way through, usually centering around a suffering hero and almost ending in a very tragic way. A really good example uh, of of tragedy of this kind of drama would be the playwright Sophocles, who lived between 496 and 406 BCE. Uh, probably his most famous play would be Oedipus the King. Some of you might be familiar with that story. You know, by the way, Greek uh, theatrical productions are still very often uh, performed uh, in the present day. Uh, sometimes, you know, in their original kind of Greek setting, in other cases, they might be updated. Uh, to conform to kind of modern day sensibilities or kind of resituated in, in the present, you know, perhaps taking place in New York or Los Angeles and so forth. Very often you might not even realize that the movie you're watching uh, or the play you're viewing is actually a reworking uh, of an ancient Greek play. So in the case of Oedipus the King, uh, it kind of centers around a fellow named Oedipus who is informed by the Oracle of Apollo. And, you know, the Oracle is someone who could predict the future with the help of the gods. Uh, and the Oracle told Oedipus that he would kill his own father and marry his mother. And so the rest of the story is basically about him doing everything possible to avoid this fate. And ironically, everything he does actually brings it about. Right, where he ends up killing his father, not knowing that it is his father, uh, marrying, marrying his widow, who of course would have been his mother, uh, unwittingly, uh, but then finally uh, being made to understand what had happened. Right, so Oedipus ultimately is forced to accept the fate ordained for him by the gods. Uh, what's really interesting though is that one lesson from that play is that in spite of the fact that you know, in a way, he couldn't escape his fate. It was always destined to be. He nonetheless was responsible for his own actions, right? Uh, one very famous quote from the play, the hand that struck me was none but my own. So as you might imagine, occasionally the Greeks needed a break from such heavy themes, and so they develop, uh, developed comedy. Uh, and, you know, again, uh, how we think of comedy in terms of a comedic film or play or even a book, a lot of that reflecting Greek influence. Uh, a really good example of Greek comedy would be the playwright Aristophanes, who lived between 450 and 385 BCE. And, you know, again, th there still was kind of the idea that you should be teaching a lesson, so very often taking the form of satire. Hopefully most of you are familiar with you know, what that term means, right? So a really good example, present day example would be say, Saturday Night Live, right? When they're, you know, kind of doing a parody of an actual political event or development or personality. And the idea is perhaps to make a point by exaggerating something, uh, you know, that, that you find wrong with that individual or how things played out and so forth to kind of exaggerate it by way of making a point. So Aristophanes did pretty much the same. A lot of his plays would satirize Athenians in particular, 
intellectuals and politicians. Uh, so one really notable example, and one I remember having to read in high school, would be The Clouds, where he made fun of the philosopher Socrates, uh, who in the play he depicts as the operator of a thought factory where people could learn deceitful ways to handle other people. Right? So he's kind of pointing out how very often you know, this kind of philosophical activity almost seemed designed just to get people you know, running around in circles and to confuse them. More topical, uh, at some point, I remember like shortly after the uh, United States invasion of Iraq, we started seeing a lot of productions of Aristophanes' Lysistrata, right? So he had written uh, Lysistrata during the time of the Peloponnesian War uh, as a way of criticizing it, right? So, you know, it's a comedy, right? And so basically what happens is that uh, the woman, in an effort to discourage the men from continuing to fight, uh, basically boycott them with, you know, refusing to have sex with them, which you know, I think it does, it's not too hard to see the comedic potential in that kind of setup, right? So they basically, what we started seeing shortly after the American invasion of Iraq were, you know, kind of updated versions of the play where they're resituated in the present time, but basically the same plot, the same dialogue, and so forth. Now the Greeks were also very famous for their architecture and for their art, particularly sculpture. And the basic idea in both cases was to really try and portray the ideal form of things, right? This in, in some ways kind of corresponded to, uh, you might remember we talked about Plato in his ideal forms, that everything we see around us is kind of a uh, you know, corrupted version of, of something more perfect. So the point of art was to somehow capture uh, that perfection, right? What they might call the classical ideal. And it should reflect the virtues of reason, moderation, balance, and harmony, right? So very often reflected, for instance, in perfect geometry. Uh, and the idea is that it should somehow civilize the emotions. Art was not about realism. Right? It, was, it was really about trying to transcend the real to achieve the ideal. Uh, architecturally speaking, probably the most famous example of that would be the Parthenon in Athens, which was built between 447 and 432 BCE. Uh, you know, it's kind of like perfect proportions, like a kind of 369 dimensions and so forth, perfect 90 degree angles, you know, every minor detail exact, right? And, you know, replicated all around the perimeter of that structure. And by the way, what you see there, the, the rather uh, poor condition of the Parthenon uh, does not re, re, uh, reflect the ravages of time, but rather uh, reflects kind of a somewhat more modern uh, event when the French under Napoleon had occupied Athens and had stored uh, gunpowder there. And, you know, accidents happen, right? Uh, skull, I think with sculpture, we really get a much clearer idea of this, you know, desire to express ideal beauty, right? So whenever you see a statue depicting the human form or the human face, and, and by the way, the Greeks tended to think that the male form was in some ways more beautiful than the female form. Um, you know, it, it was realistic in some ways, right, as we see here in the sense that uh, you know, all the limbs are properly proportioned, all the muscles are exactly the way they should be and so forth. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, it's, it's only real if, you know, every individual back then basically looked like Brad Pitt in his prime, right? It's like the perfect human form. And the ideal is not to depict real people with all their imperfections, but to, to portray the perfect uh, human form, the, the perfection of human beauty. And a really good example would be the statue you see here, uh, the Doriphoros from the fifth century. Well, we now turn to Alexander the Great, and we already mentioned Philip II, uh, who had established a kingdom in Macedonia to the north of Greece. Uh, so unlike the Greeks, the Macedonians were not organized into city-states, but rather into tribes. And it was a much more kind of rural uh, civilization. And so, you know, for a while they, they kind of, you know, 
constituted something of a confederation of semi-independent tribes, but then eventually emerging into a unified kingdom around the fourth century. And the key, uh, the key figure in that regard is in fact Philip II of Macedonia, who reigned from 359 to 336 BCE. Right? He's the guy who kind of pulled it all together. Uh, and to a large degree, part of unifying this kingdom also involved promoting Greek culture, something he admired tremendously, and also Greek military techniques, right? So he developed a very efficient professional army, largely modeled on the Greeks. We already talked about, uh, you know, the... Uh, the fact that it was kind of based on an infantry known as hoplites, uh, where they had this kind of uh, phalanx formation that they deployed. So they're going to incorporate that. Uh, they'll make a few adjustments, longer spears, for instance, and they add a cavalry. And as it turns out, I mean, with these modifications, they become probably the dominant military force in the region eventually bringing Greece under their control. This happens in 338 BCE with the Battle of Charonia. And uh, it should be noted that the Greeks themselves leading up to this battle had been very divided. There were some Greeks who actually felt like, look, you know, we've been at each other's throats for the last 70 years. Maybe we need someone to come in and unify us. We should actually willingly submit ourselves to Philip II. Uh, others disagreed, they actually won out, and so the Greeks had actually gone to war and lost. Uh, but Philip II was extremely generous in his behavior to the Greeks. He basically organized them into something known as the Corinthian League uh, under his control, uh, but for the most part allowing the different city-states to manage their own affairs. And in fact, what he really focused on was trying to un unite the Greeks with the Macedonians in opposition to uh, the empire that he presented as their uh, common foe, the Persians, right? So the ultimate objective was to actually go to war and defeat, if not destroy, the Persian Empire once and for all. Uh, Philip II was going to lead that campaign, but then he was assassinated in 336 BCE before he could undertake the invasion. And that left his son, Alexander the Great, in charge. He was only 20 years old at the time. Uh, initially, you know, th there were some who questioned whether he was capable of leading, if he could fill his father's footsteps. Uh, the Greeks actually rebelled at some point. He had to suppress that. Uh, but he very quickly showed himself to be not only as good as Philip II, uh, but even superior. And in fact, many would argue that with the possible exception of Napoleon, possibly the greatest military commander uh, that the world has ever seen. And, and during the next 12 years, uh, he would conquer, uh, from a Greek perspective, much of the then known world, including all of the Persian Empire. So just to kind of give us an overview, right? So over this 12 year period, Alexander is going to campaign uh, pretty much up until the time of his death, conquering uh, all of from the Greek perspective, pretty much all of Asia, right up to and including many parts of India, and of course, also including Egypt. And pretty much all of that, or almost all of that, the fighting is going to be against the Persian Empire, beginning in the spring of 334 BCE. And you're really gonna see a pattern develop here where pretty much uh, the Macedonians and Greeks are pretty much victorious all of the time. The first battle actually sees the ruler of the Persian Empire, Darius III, not to be confused with Darius the Great, fleeing during the battle. Uh, not a very good look for a Shah, for any kind of ruler, of course, but certainly one supposedly an agent of the gods. Uh, by the way, the scene that we see here is from a very famous mosaic from an ancient Roman town. So Alexander the Great will go on to be a great hero for the Romans. Uh, so very often important battles being depicted artistically. This comes from a mosaic from the city of Pompeii. Uh, and some of you might be familiar with uh, Pompeii was a Roman city in the south of Italy that was completely buried in ash following a volcanic eruption. So very well preserved. Uh, and so here we see what was a mosaic on the floor of a Roman villa. Uh, you can kind of see Alexander the Great to the left. 
It's not entirely clear, but it's really trying to depict Darius III in the act of, you know, just about to run away. After conquering much of pretty much the Middle East, what we call today the Middle East, roughly corresponding to Syria and Iraq, Alexander turned his attention to Egypt, which he entered in 332 BCE, brought under his control, and had himself made pharaoh and hailed as the son of the Egyptian god Amon. I wanted to highlight that particular development because, you know, while on the face of it, it, it certainly would appear egotistical, and, and certainly Alexander the Great uh, didn't have any problems in terms of self-confidence, uh, but, but this is also, in a sense, kind of his way of recognizing the local political hierarchy, uh, you know, in a sense, even showing a sensitivity to Egyptian sensibilities, you know, regarding leadership, you know, so rather than imposing a foreign kind of governmental structure on the Egyptians, he's basically, you know, keeping in place what's there, but just kind of inserting himself into it. And he's going to do this, the same thing after he defeats the Persians. Uh, the reason I, I'm mentioning it, uh, among other things, too, is like, well, it probably is actually, you know, maybe a very smart thing to do. Uh, strategically, but it is going to rub some of his soldiers the wrong way, right? Because very often the ruler in these different societies would be seen as an almost godlike figure, and this kind of ran contrary uh, to Greek and also Macedonian uh, thinking, uh, you know, about kind of you know, how government should run uh, along a more uh, democratic and egalitarian uh, structure. Uh, one other thing worth mentioning in connection with Egypt is that he lays the foundations for the city of Alexandria. I mean, there's going to be other ones, other cities of Alexandria, but this is probably going to end up being the most important one, becoming a major cultural center in the ancient world, probably most famous for the, uh, this great library that ends up developing there. Eventually, the Persians are utterly defeated. The decisive battle is the Battle of Galgamela in 331 BCE. By then, Darius III had actually been assassinated by his own men. Uh, you know, they pretty much lost respect for him after he ran away. Uh, they actually, at some point, uh, come to Alexander the Great and tell him that they killed Darius III, and he rewards them by having them killed. And that might seem a bit surprising, unless you really think more carefully about it. Uh, you really don't want to, you know, create the impression that it is okay for commoners uh, to go after royalty, right? Because, you know, yes, this time it was against your enemy, down the road it might be directed at you. In any event, by 331 BCE, the Persian Empire is no more. Uh, Alexander occupies the city of Babylon and then the imperial capital Susa and finally Persepolis, at which point he is proclaimed king of Persia. Now, you might think conquering the entirety of the Persian Empire, which was quite vast, by the way, at this time, uh, would satisfy Alexander the Great, but he was incredibly ambitious. His ultimate goal was, in fact, to conquer the entire known world, like just keep going to you until you run out of land. Uh, and so he's going to march on to India, in spite of the fact that many of his soldiers at this point really want to stop. They've become quite fatigued with fighting, uh, but they do greatly admire and respect him, so they carry on. Uh, and so after arriving in India, they actually win the first major battle, the Battle of the Hydaspes River in 326 BCE. Uh, but after that, his soldiers are like, no, we've had enough. Uh, particularly the fact that, you know, first time they actually uh, were confronted with, shall we say, war elephants. Uh, many of them decided, you know, listen, if you want to go on, you're on your own. They really were threatening to mutiny. And finally, Alexander the Great agreed to turn back. Uh, so they made their way back to Babylon, though losing many men uh, along the way, many of them in the Gudrosian desert. Uh, and so after returning to Babylon, uh, Alexander the Great pretty much dies. This happens in June of 323 BCE. Uh, very young at this point, 32 years of age. Uh, there's you know, a lot of speculation about foul play, but, but likely it was just the, a combination of a number of factors. He had been greatly weakened from wounds, uh, fever, possibly excessive alcohol, 
and he expired. You know, you know, by the way, back in the day, commanding officers would have been, you know, on the front lines, you know, not back somewhere in headquarters safe, right? They would have been out there uh, leading by example. And Alexander the Great, while a formidable warrior, uh, you know, it had taken its toll. But this is what he left behind, the empire of Alexander the Great. Up until this point, the greatest empire the world had seen. But almost immediately, it's going to break apart into a number of smaller empires. The United Kingdom, created by Alexander the Great, quickly disintegrates following his death. And in the end, four principal Hellenistic kingdoms emerge. You have Macedonia under the Antigonid dynasty, and that would have included Greece, uh, a very large empire under the Seleucids, constituting Syria and pretty much everything to the east all the way up to and up to a point in time, including parts of India. Uh, Egypt under the Ptolemies, also a sizable empire. Uh, and then finally, uh, the kingdom, the Attalid kingdom of Pergamon, which is kind of small, but a very, very important location, kind of in the center, roughly corresponding to the western part of Asia Minor or modern-day modern Turkey. By the way, many of those names, Seleucid, Ptolemy, so forth, the names of some of the more important generals of Alexander the Great who established their control over these different kingdoms and uh, initiated dynasties. So this map gives you a pretty good idea of what the Hellenistic monarchies looked like. So even though they are distinct kingdoms under different rulers, uh, nonetheless constituting a kind of unified civilizational entity, right? So a lot of traffic moving uh, back and forth between them and all of them undergoing a tremendous influence from the ancient Greeks. Hence why we often refer to it collectively as a Hellenistic world. And again, the, the term Hellenistic derived from a Greek word meaning to imitate the Greeks, right? So you're going to see uh, kind of the growing pervasiveness of Greek culture to some degree intermingling with whatever cultures they encounter, but also in some ways kind of defining, you know, kind of the dominant culture in the sense of, you know, corresponding to where political authority resided, right? Uh, and along the way, you're going to see the establishment of many city-states modeled on those from mainland Greece, right? So on the one hand, you have governments founded on the principle of monarchy with respect to the entirety of these kingdoms, but within them, numerous cities and military colonies are going to be established, which are very much modeled on the city-states of mainland Greece. And many of them, in fact, eventually being populated primarily by Greeks, uh, also Macedonians. Uh, initially, you know, it's primarily soldiers, military personnel, many of them mercenaries. But eventually, you know, after things become stable-ish, soon followed by Greek engineers, intellectuals, merchants, administrators, and so forth. And of course, they brought with them the Greek language, architecture, art, literature, and ideas. Again, the cities modeled politically on the Greek polis, uh, and then incorporating various elements of Greek culture and Greek laws. You know, if you were to visit one of these cities, uh, if someone didn't tell you that you're actually in Asia, you might have thought that you were in uh, in Athens or Sparta or one of the Greek city-states on the mainland of Greece. Uh, having said that, over time, they would also be influenced by quote-unquote Eastern ways, by the you know, kind of surrounding indigenous cultures. So you have some degree of fusion, but the Greek element kind of remaining dominant, particularly in the city-states. Uh, and uh, people of Greek origin or who had adopted Greek culture and the Greek language definitely constituting a kind of political elite. So a really good example of these kind of Hellenic city-states, you know, sometimes kind of packed together. Very famous example would be what's known as the Decapolis, uh, i.e. 10 Greek city-states uh, in Asia, in the Middle East, roughly corresponding to modern-day uh, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and Syria. But you can see from the map that they're all located very close to one another and very heavily influenced uh, by Greek culture and the Greek city-states, right? And here you see on the right, we have an image from the uh, city of Jarash, 
I mean, it's the ruins of the city, no longer inhabited. And as you might imagine, a very popular tourist destination uh, among, well, all of them actually, all the cities that make up the Decapolis for people visiting that part of the world. Again, though, noting that the Greeks ended up constituting a kind of political or ruling elite, indigenous people sometimes coming to resent this. And really, if you wanted to get ahead in any of the uh, Hellenistic kingdoms, you, you know, if you were a native, uh, part of the indigenous culture there, the only way to do that was to really become Greek, right? It generally meant becoming Hellenized and letting go or foregoing one's own culture. Uh, and so, you know, again, the city-states are somewhat independent, but very dependent for their overall security on the kings, right? The rulers of these four main kingdoms, uh, but who, who also in turn use them as instruments of government, right? So other examples of the kind of Greek influence in the Hellenistic world would have been, would have been evident in uh, you know, the kind of education people receive, right? Probably the most important institution, uh, and this actually developed during the Hellenistic period, would have been the gymnasium. Uh, you know, gymnasium, by the way, even today in Europe, corresponding more to what for Americans would be high school, right? Where you, you receive kind of a primary education. It would have also included a kind of physical education, uh, but not just that, as we, you know, we tend, if you hear the word gymnasium, in the United States, you think of it as meaning, you know, kind of a gym where you make sport, and that's about it. In fact, a, uh, the kind of education you would have received in the gymnasium would have included music, physical exercise, of course, and literature. By the way, Homer is still very important, uh, and, you know, so his poetry would have been very strongly emphasized. The Hellenistic world also kind of creating an environment where you know, intellectuals from various corners of these four kingdoms could come together and share their learning, uh, you know, and, and kind of build upon one another in terms of different intellectual pursuits and developments. And this is probably nowhere better exemplified than with the Library of Alexandria at that time, the greatest library you know, in terms of having an outstanding collection that the world had ever seen. Right. So, you know, imagine that if you're an intellectual back then, you show up here and everything you could possibly have an interest in all in one location. Probably the modern day equivalent of that would be the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., which, by the way, if you ever have a chance, if you're down there, you can visit, you know, kind of more in a uh, tourist capacity, if you will. Uh, but it is today the largest library in the world in terms of the size of its collection. Now, Hellenistic art, very much influenced by that of classical Greece. Uh, and so, you know, very often, um, you know, we talked about how the kings use these Hellenistic city-states as instruments of their government. Very often, uh, one way of kind of keeping them, uh, maintaining their support would be to patronize them by beautifying the cities uh, in their states. And so this prevented tremendous opportunity for Greek architects and sculptures. Uh, and so a lot of the, uh, the sculpture in particular, you know, very much, uh, very similar to what we would find in uh, classical Greece. A good example would be this one, uh, Lacun and his sons, which is actually depicting an episode from the Iliad. Uh, but, you know, here we see kind of the human form presented in a very kind of idealistic way. But one development that kind of reflected a departure in this regard uh, was a tendency for art to become more realistic over time, right? So at some point it was no longer about trying to capture the ideal, uh, but more about depicting real people with all their very real emotions, including human suffering. Something evident here in this statue of what would appear to be a, you know, a rather old woman who is under some duress. Uh, you know, maybe one might speculate that she's even going hungry. Possibly the most important developments during the Hellenistic uh, period culturally relate to uh, science and mathematics, right? So to some degree, this reflects the kind of growing influence of uh, the philosophy of Aristotle, which you might remember was very much rooted in empiricism, right? Through observation, experimentation, and trying to understand how the natural world operated. And so some really important advancements will be made during this period. 
Uh, so some really good examples, Aristarchus of Samos, who lived between roughly 310 and 230 BCE. Uh, and so he was, you know, uh, effectively an astronomer who actually developed the heliocentric view of the universe, right? The idea that the sun is at the center and that the earth and the other planets go around it, uh, depicted here in a Greek uh, postage stamp. Uh, by the way, eventually his theory, which you know, obviously is correct, would fall into disfavor uh, during the medieval period in Europe, uh, which would basically promote Aristotle's view, uh, the geocentric perspective, that the Earth is at the center. And it won't be until the 15th century that a Polish astronomer named uh, Copernicus is going to effectively rediscover the heliocentric theory. Uh, a lot of what we, you know, how we teach geometry today actually uh, based on a fellow named Euclid who lived uh, circa 300 BCE. So he didn't really develop, uh, you know, kind of geometrical concepts and theories, but he basically kind of pulled it all together and developed a systematic organization of the fundamental elements of, geo of geometry, such as were understood until then. Right, so kind of showed how like kind of different concepts, different ideas all interconnected in you know, some kind of unified way. And then put this all together in a work known as the elements. And again, pretty much how we teach geometry today is based on him. And then finally, we might note Archimedes uh, living around between 287 to 12 BCE, uh, originating, uh, originally coming from Sicily. He's kind of more an inventor than a scientist per se, and was actually quite famed for his inventions. Uh, there's kind of a story about, you know, a city that's being laid siege to that tried to intimidate the invading force, uh, you know, with stories of how Archimedes was creating weapons of war for them. Uh, I don't remember how that actually turned out. Uh, though he is known for, you know, kind of certain intellectual advancements. He's very well known, for instance, for uh, his work on the geometry of spheres and cylinders, for establishing the value of the mathematical constant pi. Uh, and in connection with his in inventions, uh, he did a lot of work having to do with hydrostatics, kind of using water and pressure in order to make things move like machines. I would conclude our discussion of the Hellenistic world by uh, briefly discussing two very important schools of philosophy that developed during this period uh, that would, would carry on during the Roman period as well. Uh, the first, Epicureanism, and they're kind of like the, the opposites of one another. So Epicureanism uh, takes its name from the founder of this philosophical school, Epicurus, established a school in Athens. This was somewhere between 341 to 70 BCE. Uh, and the basic deal with Epicureanism, uh, if I were going to give you a short definition, I'd say it's the don't worry, be happy philosophy of life. Right? So sometimes referred to as the doctrine of pleasure. The point being that the goal of life is happiness. The pursuit of pleasure, meaning not, you know, kind of hedonistic lifestyle, you know, drinking and drugs and so forth, but freedom from worry. Right, kind of focusing on the simple pleasures of life, family, friends, good food, good weather, uh, and so forth. Right? It's kind of the idea that you really can't do much about the problems of the world. Right? So you should focus on your own happiness. And really the only way of achieving that is you know, by not worrying about the problems of the world, just kind of focusing on the simple pleasures uh, of life. The opposite of Epicureanism is, uh, and you can really make the case, I think that in some ways, almost in direct opposition to one, an one another, is Stoicism, which in this case does not take its name from its founder, who was a fellow named Zeno, operating roughly during the same period, 335 to 263 BCE, again, uh, operating in Athens. Uh, the name actually comes uh, from the place where he actually preached his philosophical perspective, right? Uh, a public colonnade known as the Painted Portico or Stoa Poikile, Stoa, i.e. Stoicism. And if I had to give the short definition in this case, I would say it's basically grin and, and bear it, or as the British might say, you know, maintain a stiff upper 
lip. Happiness could only be found in virtue, right? You, you really just need to accept the hand that life has dealt you, embrace it, and don't complain, right? Rise to the occasion. Live in accordance with the divine will, which means accepting whatever life brings you. And only in this way will you master yourself and find peace. And Stoicism actually will end up being more influential with the ancient Romans in large measure because it really found a kind of concordance with Roman values uh, such as they existed from, from the earliest point, right? Where, you know, it's always this idea that you shouldn't shirk your duty, you shouldn't run away from, uh, you know, any kind of dire situation that, that you're confronted with. Uh, in any event, we're going to stop here. Uh, so this concludes the uh, third lecture, uh, corresponding roughly to chapter three. Next time I see you, we'll be moving on to uh, the subject matter of chapter four, uh, where among other things, we'll learn a good deal more about the ancient Persians.